It is now my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce the chair of today's program, Stephen Miller. He's the managing partner of McDermott, Quilty, and Miller in Boston, where he concentrates in government affairs, business strategies, zoning, and licensing law. He has represented clients in all sectors of the alcoholic beverages and hospitality industries, including wholesalers, suppliers, and on-premises and off-premises licensees before municipal, state, and federal administrative authorities. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is, I think, uh, maybe my seventh or eighth time uh, I've been doing this for MCLE, and I do look forward to it. Hey, David. Uh, uh, I do look forward to it every year. Um, uh, do we have a new book this year. We've updated the book. Um, and I have to give uh, credit to my partner, Karen Sameo, and uh, Marcy Costa, who's uh, here, one of our law clerks that uh, did the majority of the work. While my name's on the book, uh, I have to give them the credit for the majority of the work. Uh, I'd like to introduce our panel. Uh, my left is Dina Conlin. She's an attorney at uh, Greenberg Troward. Uh, she is, has served for three years, two or three years? I just looked, actually. It's almost five now. Uh, that's how quick it goes. I know. Five years on the Newton License Commission. She's an accomplished attorney, has a great background, and uh, really was part of a total change of the Newton Licensing Board. So we'll have quite a few. Uh, interesting insights as to uh, coming from a uh, area where you really had no background on licensing, uh, what she's seen over the past uh, five years. Next is Kim Gainsborough, who has recently left as uh, chair of the ABCC, who basically was the ABCC chair for about, what, 30 years, give or take? About like 150. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> and um, now is in private practice. Uh, Kim was responsible for many changes at the ABCC, and for those of you that were here last year or, or watched the program, um, really was a driving force of e-licensing, which is still in its infancy, and uh, I'm sure will be uh, finished in the, in the near future. Uh, Jean Larizio is the current chair of the ABCC, <coughs> has served on the panels, as has Kim, several times. Um, Jean was the former executive director of the Boston Licensing Board for a number of years and now has moved on to take Kim's place at the uh, ABCC. So um, Jean has significant experience at both the local level and now at the state level. Um, we have, after that, Chris Polgini, who, now I'm going to be wrong on this, three years, four years? Two and a half. Two and a half, all right. Um, like Chris hours. has uh, taken over as the chair of the Boston Licensing Board and has uh, really been very innovative as, as, uh, with her approach on, on both the uh, liquor licensing issues and the entertainment issues, so uh, I very much look forward to hearing Chris's uh, perspective on this. And last is my partner, Karen Sameo, who's been with me, seems like forever, but uh, uh, 15 years at least, right? Feels like 150, but yeah. seven, <laughs> seven, 17 years. 17, uh, 17 years. years. I'm, time flies, and uh, Karen has worked on um, licensing issues with me from the very beginning, and. Um, uh, is really someone I rely on every day, so I'm happy to have her here. Um, I would just, uh, we're very fortunate to have an extremely knowledgeable and experienced panel, so uh, don't hesitate to ask questions, whether it's during uh, the time that we're uh, presenting or at the break, and we'd love to uh, answer those questions and, and give you our insight. Um, I'll just plug one thing. Um, I was part of a panel two months ago for uh, MCLE and it was representing microbrewers and um, it's very much part of uh, 
the licensing experience, particularly these days. It's, you read a lot about it, and it's the pharma wineries and pharma breweries and manufacturing and uh, a lot of those issues. So uh, that's a very recent, it's a new book, and it's very recent. So you can sign up and watch the program um, through the webcast, or, and you would get the book, or you can just buy the book, but I would recommend, um, and I don't get any commission on uh, selling the book, but I, I recommend it. So, um, uh, Jean, do you want me to do a couple, of little few update issues, or do you want to start with updates? Uh, However you would like to proceed. So why don't you go, and then I, I if uh, there's a couple that, if you don't have them, I'll, I'll put them on. So, Jean Lorizio. Chapter 153 of the Act of 1997 was passed, which, which allowed donations of wine to be made to charitable corporations, which were organized under Chapter 180 and registered with the Public Charities Division of the Attorney General's Office. That wine was allowed to be donated and could either be served at that charity event or um, sold at auction at that charity event, but it was specific to wine. Um, since that time, there have been, in my time in Boston and now in my time at the EBCC, there have been increasing numbers of questions about beer and distilled spirits being donated, which wasn't allowed under the law. Um, in January, Chapter 458 of the Acts of 2016 was approved, but it's a little tricky in that instead of amending the charity wine provision, the legislature amended Section 14, which governs one-day licenses. Um, one day licenses, under one day licenses, donations were not accepted, but the language that they put into section 14 now allows for nonprofits to accept distilled spirits or beer. Um, the only caveat there is that under section 14, a local board wouldn't issue a one day license to a licensed premise. Under the charity wine provision, a charity would be able to hold their event at a licensed premise or at their headquarters. With this change to section 14, it excludes the, um, any licensed premise from holding these events, which is where most of them, at least in Boston, we saw most of them were held in the, in the bigger hotels. They would have annual galas that were charity events. It seems to be a, a mistake or an oversight, and, and I believe the legislature wants to fix it, but the way it reads right now, leads to confusion really. They, they added language into um, section 14 that just says a nonprofit charitable corporation organized pursuant to chapter 180 and registered with the Division of Public Charities and licensed pursuant to the section may accept free alcoholic beverages donated to the nonprofit charitable corporation. So it doesn't provide for oversight by the UCC first of all, which I should have said and I should backtrack and say that under the charity one provision, those one days are approved not only by the local board but by the ABCC as well. So in putting this language into section 14, it takes that, that level of approval out of it. Um, and really, it just does seem to be very convoluted right. and confusing for both the local boards and the uh, charity. So I'm hoping, I'm hopeful, the legislature's aware of the, of the unique situation here, and I, and I think they're going to take action to kind of rectify that and perhaps just simply change the charity wine provision to make it apply for wine here and distilled spirit. So hopefully that will be happening in the near future. Jean, can I ask one clarification just from the local yes. board perspective? Sure. Is Does that allow it to be drunk on the premises also? Yes. So because the charity wine, I remember, was sort of, they could auction it but not. They could drink it. They as could drink it as well? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So now they can drink the beer and the spirits. Mm -hmm on the premises under the section 14, but right. the wine but isn't it, different. Okay. Right, it can't, with the beer and the distilled spirits, that event can't be held at a licensed premise anymore. I got it, okay. Interesting, so thank you. It excludes a lot, of the, a lot of the big events that would take advantage of this charity wine provision in the past. And in August of last year, Governor Baker signed into law 
um, some changes to the farmer series pouring permits. Um, since that time, those licenses, farmer wineries, farmer breweries, or farmer distilleries may obtain pouring permits that would allow them to sell for consumption not only on their own licensed premise, but also on the farmlands and or vineyards that operate a pertinent and contiguous and in conjunction with the licensed premise. Um, under this provision was also created a new type of farmer series license, a 19H, which allows a farmer holding more than one type of a farmer series license, so if a farmer holds a farmer brewery and a farmer winery license, they are permitted to um, sell any and all alcohol produced by them or in their name for them um, for on-premise consumption on any of their farmer series premises, vineyards and farmlands, provided that the vineyards and farmlands are operated as a pertinent and contiguous to each other. So that, that's a big change. Previously, if you had a farmer brewery, you could only serve and sell on the brewery premise. If you had a farmer winery, it was only on the farmer winery. But now if you have a farm that operates and produces, you have the two licenses and you produce both products, they can be served and sold to as long as it's a pertinent and contiguous in operation. Also in August of last year, um, there was a change eliminating the prohibition against licensee holding both a Section 12 license, which includes on-premise licensees, restaurants, hotels, um, clubs, GOPs, and, section, and a Section 15 license, a retail package store in the same city or town that's no longer prohibited. You can hold a, you can operate a restaurant and a package store in any city and town in Massachusetts. Um, in addition, the same change um, added language regarding a Section 12 license restaurant, restaurant only, none of the other Section 12 licensees from having a Section 15 package store license physically connected to it. Um, connected to it, but at the same time, two conditions must be met. At least 50% of the revenue generated in the package store must be from the sale of grocery items. Grocery items are defined under the law in Chapter 94, Section 184B. And the physical connection between the two has to be clearly delineated. Um, I think this, a good example of this is the Eataly operation in the Prudential, where there's a big restaurant market, and they also operate a package store, but they are clearly um, delineated one from the other. And like I said, this only applies to a Section 12 restaurant. A, a Section 12 otherwise operating as a hotel or a club or a general on-premise cannot hold the 15, um, 15 connected to it. Are we holding questions till the end, or do you want? If somebody has questions now, I think we can. We can. If anybody has a question. Uh, those changes uh, are shown right in section 12 and 15 right now. Yes. And there's an advisory actually on the ABCC's website. If you go onto the home page, you'll find it right over on the right hand side. Steve, I know you spoke about your, your last seminar here. I don't know if you want to, the operating proprietorships is one of the things I was going to touch on. I don't know if that's something you Well, said. it's in the book. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, in July of 2016, Chapter 138 was amended to create a tenant floor license, uh, which would fall under Section 19G. Uh, under this license, a uh, host brewer, if you will, which would be an existing farmer brewer, agreed to rent space and its equipment to a tenant brewer. In order for this to be approved, both the host and the tenant must be qualified as a brewer by the tobacco trade, uh, I'm sorry, the Alcohol, Tobacco, Tax, and Trade Bureau. Um, and the TTB actually has to approve the alternating proprietorship arrangement before uh, the ABCC can approve it. And I've in the advisory on the ABCC's website, you'll see a link. The TTB actually issued an online circular regarding these arrangements, which is pretty informative. It's pretty lengthy and pretty informative. It's good to note, under these 19G licenses, the sale is not permitted. It's strictly limited to the manufacture and packaging of the malt beverage at the um, host brewer's premise. So I could, I could jump in there. I would. 
recommend uh, that you look at the advisory. This is something that is very current because of all the craft beers and the difference uh, between contract brewing and a tenant brewer, uh, where um, a brewery, and he actually was a, he's a client of our firm and, and participated in the uh, in the seminar, a, a beer like Clown Shoes, for instance, has, uh, uh, and if you came to that seminar, by the way, he brought beer, uh, <laughs> which I thought was pretty good. We didn't drink it, and uh, people could take it home. We didn't get a chance to drink it, but. Uh, in, in that case, he was a contract brewer. Um, he contracted with a licensed manufacturer, a uh, farmer brewery, um, or a brewery, not just farmer brewery, to uh, produce his product. And um, in the alternative, there's a lot of tenant brewers where different farmer breweries or, or some of the manufacturers in the state, there's a few manufacturers in the state, brewery manufacturers, that can uh, have excess capacity and basically are allowing an outside entity to come in and be a tenant and brew their product. Um, it's very specific. Uh, the advisory is very specific from the ABCC and it's also very specific from the uh, TTB. So I highly recommend that if you um, are in that situation that you spend some time understanding the difference between the two and, uh, <coughs> and reading those advisories, particularly the TTB. Sorry, Jean. No, that's okay. I, and I would just add that, I mean, I, I think we're all sort of looking out and there are a lot of new faces. We've, we've done this for the past, you know, four or five years for me, and it's great to see new faces. And um, I'm not sure how how experienced you all are, but <clears throat> in terms of alcohol beverages licensing and the regulatory scheme, it's it's so highly regulated, which I'm sure you all know by now, no matter how experienced you are or not. So, the licenses that are issued, whether it's by the TTB or by the local board or by the ABCC, are, are premise premises specific, which is why this is, has become such a, a hot issue, because generally speaking, you can only have one license at a premises. And so this whole notion of contract brewing and more specifically alternating proprietorship really sort of changes that landscape in some way. As Steve was saying, with the contract brewing situation, essentially you have somebody who does not necessarily have the equipment or the capacity to manufacture an alcoholic beverages product, but they do have a recipe, right? They've come up with some sort of way that they've, they wanna craft a beer or craft a distilled spirit, and they've come up with this recipe, and then they've, they're essentially going to a licensed premises, a licensed manufacturer, and they're asking them, I'm gonna pay you to create this this recipe for me and then there's a whole relationship where it has to come back it has to go to a licensed wholesaler and then that's how it moves you know through the commonwealth with an alternating proprietorship as steve said it's really about i'm going out i have decided that i want to be a craft brewer or i've decided that i want to create you know grow grapes and and make wine and i am going to go to one of the manufacturers that are in the Commonwealth who, who has created this beautiful new canning machine, this new canning um, machinery and processing, and I'm gonna say to them, hey, I'd like to rent out a piece of your plant on Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays from sort of nine to five. And, and because of economies of scale and trying to sort of um, pave a way for these people while taking away the startup costs associated with something like that, that's something that the TTB allows and that's something that the ABCC allows as well. Um, but as, as Steve and Jean both said, you, you, know, you have to really make sure that what you're doing is, is okay. You have to go to the TTB first with the alternating proprietorship. You have to fill out the application. You have to get their permission. They look at it. They want to make sure that your client is actually an alternating proprietorship and not a contract brewer. Because if you're an alternating proprietorship, you're essentially getting a manufacturer's license and you can distribute the process. You can distribute the beverages. If you're in a contract brewing situation, the manufacturer must not distribute 
the product for you. You, you, they are making it for you, but you are supposed to take it back and you are supposed to find a wholesaler or you're supposed to have a wholesale license to distribute it yourself. And the TTB is very concerned about that because of the taxes. It's all about, it's all about the taxes. It's all about, it's all about the money. Right, 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 Steve. It's all about they want to be able. So if you have a client who is a manufacturer, you have to make sure that you're protecting them. You have to make sure that if the TTB walks in, that they're going to be able to tell what they pay taxes on, what they haven't paid taxes on, what's theirs and what's not, what's not theirs. And, you know, I've been to a lot of the manufacturers and the wholesalers, and, you know, if you go into their warehouses, they have lines you know, all on the ground, which which clearly delineate what has been paid taxes and what hasn't been. So, you know, the advisory, I think, it you know, is, is good. It's very informative, and you should look at it. And I'm sorry so as, <laughs> as you can tell, uh, Kim was the chair when that advisory came out. Uh, so I, we do have a question and the comment. Uh, the comment was asking you to speak, maybe put the microphone closer. And the question was... Uh, how does the Section 15 demonstrate that 50% or more of the sales will come from grocery items if they're not open? And I can take a crack at it, but um, so this was, uh, this legislation went through the State House um, known as the Wegmans Bill. And because Wegmans has restaurants on site and they also would like to have package stores on site. and. Um, pretty much on the same premises. So the, um, when the legislature addressed it, they first addressed the issue of taking away the restriction of having a restaurant and a package store in the same city or town, which they removed that restriction. And then they uh, went and dealt with the issue of having a um, restaurant and package store in basically the same premises. and. Uh, because of Wegmans and, and I think Whole Foods is looking at the same thing and some of the other grocery stores and um, it originally was uh, what was going through the state house as the Eataly bill and uh, our firm had it represents Eataly and we had already got Eataly licensed before um, that and, and using different ways to, to make sure that uh, we complied with the law. Uh, before this went through, so then it be quickly became the Wegmans bill as opposed to e the Italy bill. But uh, it was pretty easy with the various licensing boards in answer to your question to show them that, you know, it's Wegmans, it's a grocery store. Um, there wasn't any question that 50% or more would be uh, coming from that. I, I suppose if you're in a situation where it's a cafe, um, you might have a little bit more uh, problem showing a local board that 50 percent or more and then and confirming it with the ABCC but I, I don't think there's any particular way of, of doing that other than history of the operation and if it's a brand new operation showing projections on on what you're going to do so that's the answer to that question Jean I'm sorry to that's okay thank you there, there are a couple other simple changes that were made um, as of August of 2016 package stores um, who previously could not open on the Monday after Christmas, when Christmas falls on a Sunday, can now open on that Monday, as well as um, wholesalers, importers, and manufacturers may now sell and deliver on that Monday as well. Um, there was a simple change made to <coughs> the law regarding recorking of wine. Um, restaurants and hotels had been permitted to recork customers unfinished bottles of wine so they can take them with them if they did not finish them and in October of 2016 that was expanded to include all licenses under section 12 so now taverns clubs war veterans organizations can also um, provide that service to their patrons if they if they have wine that's unfinished and in February of 2017 there was a change in the law to permit private clubs to allow members to bring wine onto the premise for their consumption with a meal. Um, there are specific requirements that must be followed. They um, may only bring, members may only bring wine on, no beer or distilled spirits or liqueurs. They must purchase a meal 
and consume the wine with that meal. At all times, the club must handle the dispensing and serving of the wine. Unopened bottles must be returned to the patrons who must remove them from the uh, premise. The unfinished bottles, if any, can be recorked in accordance with that last regulation I spoke about, the last law I spoke about. And um, the law actually states that the club must charge a reasonable corkage fee of at least $30 per bottle. And uh, it's also worth noting that a club does not have to allow this. It's up to each individual club whether or not they want to allow members to bring wine onto the premise. One other, it's not a change in the law, but it was something new that the commission has taken up since I've been there. Um, there was a request um, from MGM Springfield, MGM Resorts International. They are one of the, one of the approved uh, casinos going into the state. They are looking to open up at 1200 Main Street in Springfield, and they actually submitted a request to the ABCC for a hearing and an advisory opinion on whether or not they could have two Section 15 package stores located within their uh, casino, which would overlap their casino license as issued by the Gaming Commission. <coughs> and um, after a full presentation and given an examination of the law, um, under section, I mean, I'm sorry, under chapter 23K, section 26, um, it, the ABCC determined that there was no prohibition on this placement of these two package store licenses overlapping the casino license. That being said, it was specified in the advisory ruling that each license has to be distinct and separate in their record keeping, their storage, their purchasing, they can't buy from one another. Um, all those same restrictions that would apply, but because the law, because Chapter 138 only states that Section 12s and Section 15s can't be commingled, it does not. The the the. I'm sorry. The um, the, the Gaming Commission, the the 23 case, Chapter 23K, doesn't doesn't state that. And um, given that it was silent on that it's only prohibited with the 12 and the 15. It's not a 12 that they're going to hold. They're going to hold a license under Chapter 23K, and the ABCC determined that it was not. Given what was presented at the advisory hearing, they, there was not a problem with what they were proposing. So we'll see as that goes forward. They don't have their gaming license as of yet because their plans weren't completely finished as, as, as far as floor plans and the actual space itself, so they, they haven't been they haven't received final approval for that, but it seems like it's going forward. Um, Steve, I think you had asked me to speak about e-licensing in the task force as well. I don't know if you want me to do that now or if yeah, you Yeah, no, I, I think that, sure. Okay, so sure. Um, you may have heard that the, the treasurer um, instituted a task force to look at Chapter 138, the, the Liquor Control Act, and to um, examine the law and come back with any kind of recommendations that they may have for improving or changing updating and um, the ABCC is not a member of the task force but at the same time we were asked to uh, participate as far as um, educational for educational purposes really I attended each of their meetings thus far with Ralph Sacramoni who's the executive director at the ABCC and Chris Foster who's general counsel to the ABCC and um, it was good conversations back and forth just kind of helping the task force members understand how the ABCC works how the laws work um, and at this point now, they're moving on to public hearings. Their first one is actually tomorrow in Waltham at 11 a.m. in the morning. Um, they're going across the state with six hearings between now and mid to late June, um, and we'll see they'll come back with a, a report for the treasurer as to what, they, what, what their findings are based on what they hear from the public, from the industry, and the like. Um, it was an interesting, interesting process. They're ni a nice bunch of people, and they're really interested to learn about about the laws and about about the industry. So it was it was a fun process, actually. And then, as far as e-licensing goes, um, Steve <laughs> alluded to <laughs> Chairman Gainsborough's uh, streamlining that process and getting it moving. We are continuing. The ABCC is working with a group of pilot cities and towns that are completely. Uh, operating through the e-licensing system. And the cities and towns have been great. We meet with them weekly to
to hear about any issues, concerns, problems, or you know, good things that are happening with the with the e-licensing system. As far as every other city in town in the state, what happens is applications come in in paper, and we have expediters in our office who input them into the e-licensing system. So while the applications are coming in in paper, once we receive them, they basically are converted into an e-licensing application, and notifications going forward are sent via email. Um, there are definitely still some issues that we're working out, but we're we're hopeful that you know things are things are going down the right track, and we're actually asking anybody with feedback, whether it's a local board, an attorney, an applicant. Um, I was actually told today for anybody that is actually using the system that we're trying to streamline the approval emails that are going out. I know there was some confusion about what actually, um, the, the information that was included in there, some people felt it wasn't enough. And what hopefully will be out in the very near future is a approval email that actually kind of mirrors the old Form 43, which gave you pretty much all you would need to know about, about the application. So we're hoping to have that completed in the near future. I think that's all I have. I just want to uh, bring up one more point on the changes um, where the restriction was removed on Section 12 and Sections 15 on the Wegmans part of the bill. Um, the areas still, once again, have to be separate and defined. So um, Wegmans can't have a cafe license and uh, Therefore, you can walk around the entire store um, with drinking with a glass of wine. It has to be restricted to the cafe, and the same thing. Um, usually, what what they're doing is having the entire grocery part of the premises uh, be the uh, Section 15 license. So, therefore, they can sell beer and and wine and, and alcohol, the other uh, distilled spirits, if if they want to throughout the premises, uh, if, if the local board will allow that. Uh, but the cafe part of it has to be separate and defined so you can't walk around. The difference being in Italy, um, when we did it, we got the Italy license before this was passed. And uh, Italy, if you've been to Italy, there are several different restaurants and um, wine bars and whatever. And that whole premise is licensed as a Section 12 license, as opposed to a Section 15. And there's a small area, there's a small wine store, um, which is separately owned, um, not by not by Italy, but separately owned. That's separate and distinct. And when this bill passed, Italy, the, the owners of Italy felt this would be great. We can now take over the package store. And I said, you can, except now people can't walk around while they're doing all their shopping with a glass of wine and they said uh, that they would prefer to keep it where it was. So um, I just also want to mention that um, Jean followed Kim and uh, leaving the licensing board as the executive secretary and Leslie St. Germain who's here uh, moved from McDermott, Quilty and Miller um, uh, to the uh, Boston Licensing Board as the Executive Secretary. Also, I'll give you a tip. There's a, besides, you probably can't get to the chairwoman very often at the ABCC, but um, Ralph Sacramone is a good name to know, and Kyle Gill, um, who happens to also be here from the ABCC, um, is a person that is very helpful to when you have questions. and. and getting things done and, and answers. I usually give out Ralph's cell phone number around this time. Yeah, around right. this <laughs> well, you can do it because no, you were the chair and you left. <laughs> if I did it, if I did it, you I, I, I pass that baton to Chief you, if that's something that you want. He wouldn't talk to me again. Um, He's on the website, though. Very easy to get. If you call him, he'll give you his, his cell phone. Dave. I have a question for, for the uh, Of all of the changes that you discussed, that were by statute in the last year or so. Are they all self-executing, or are they uh, the type of changes that would permit a licensing authority to you know, change hours <coughs> or, or change premises or change any of the licensing conditions? No, they were self-executing. Right, so yep. they're, they're, they're imposed notwithstanding 
any of the uh, uh, provisions that uh, or conditions that that a licensing authority may have imposed. For example, at the, the change in the Memorial Day, I have a municipal client that has just routinely always put in their license <coughs> that you cannot sell on Memorial Day. Well, that's changed now. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and that would void that portion of the, uh, mm -hmm. the authority that was provided in that license. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the changes still have to go through um, local board approval and, and obviously the the Section 12, Section 15 grocery store, it's all subject to local board approval. Um, there are different approvals required on the, on the uh, Pharma Winery, Pharma Series pouring permits, that, that a pouring permit has to be approved locally. And then also the, the changes to that pouring permit are uh, alteration of premises, which also go through locally. So the, the local board hasn't been cut out, but, but they are in effect. Were you asking if the local board has to accept these changes or if they're law? Well, you yeah, because uh, I, I know, in, it's like, for example, the, uh, the change that was made several years ago regarding uh, uh, the brunch, mm -hmm. right, going mm -hmm. from 12 to 10, that was something that was at the discretion of the local right. board. Right. Uh, the type of change that you just described for Memorial Day, for example, doesn't have to go before the board for, right. for right. an individual retailer just gets that authority. Right. Uh, without the need for uh, further action from the local board. Right. And um, just to follow up on that, I know that there was a change, I can't remember how many years ago it was, from the um, package store, too, from 12 to 10, mm -hmm. which was um, some people came in front of the board, they but they did not have to. Right. Um, our understanding was they had to notify us exactly. that they were going to exercise that option. Right. but didn't need any approval. But the sure. brunch one for was, that. was a little strange, the, it way was. That, the way that it was written. It was. The was local not boards as needed clear as that. to say that it was mm -hmm. okay, yes. Mm -hmm. They had to accept the provision. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. But it was different than the package. You're exactly right. right. Yeah. It was a little, you know, sometimes fucky things happen. <laughs> <laughs> like the whole beer and wine. Like the whole beer and distilled spirits. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yep. Could you repeat the um, approval email? Sure. Well, what's um, it's a it's a work in progress to kind of fix, if you will, the approval email that's being sent out through the e-licensing system. Some people had we had gotten feedback that there wasn't enough information in that email for the local boards. Right. So what's hopefully is going to be sent out soon will be an approval email that kind of mirrors the old Form 43. Are you familiar with that? So it would give you all of the information, the licensee's name, what they were petitioning to do, lots of information on it. Would you So uh, one other thing, Jean, and I think this was, um, I think we might have covered it last year, but the, the changes um, on the applications and financial disclosures for instance, where, um, and, and I think this might have been covered last year, but do you want to just address that quickly? Or? You had put that on your list, but I wasn't quite sure what you were referring well, to. I mean, I know uh, in the past, landlords had to, if, if Well, that's, that's one of them, and then mm -hmm. over 50,000 and under 50,000. Right. So. Um, was that monetary amount lowered? Um, or was it just? Yeah, it, it, there was, was a, if it was a, the commission had decided that if you were if you were borrowing more than fifty thousand dollars, that you needed financial statements, you needed to disclose who you were borrowing from. Maybe we needed to get affidavits from those people. Was it a gift? Was it a loan? And um, we've since I think they've we've since dispensed with that requirement. It's it went from sort of fifty to nothing, and it was you know because if you have loans, you, you're going to show us. You know you're disclosing all the loans. Um, and then in the past, if the landlord had a percentage, uh, if the rent was ba based on a percentage yeah. of your alcohol sales, the landlord had to be disclosed and had to fill out certain forms. And that is that is no longer the case. It has to be disclosed, but there are no. Um, they've, we've decided that they've decided that there's no interest in the license right. by the landlord, even if they are receiving um, in their rent money from the sale of the alcoholic beverages. Oh. So you would still disclose it on the application. In that, I think section 10, yes. uh, that the landlord has percentage rent, but the landlord is no longer required 
to fill out. It's not considered beneficial interest right. holder, right. so, they, so they, they, don't have to fill they don't have to fill out all the personal information forms in the quarries, which um, you can imagine over the years was particularly difficult with some mm -hmm. of the bigger landlords when you told them that they had to fill these forms out. Um, but that the ABCC in their wisdom decided that they didn't have to do that anymore. Uh, so any other questions?